You're listening to the Kick Your Boots Up podcast, where we swap stories of the West. Whether you're just waking up or getting in for the day, come on in and kick your boots up. Hi, everybody, and thanks for listening to the Kick Your Boots Up podcast. This week's episode is a a sure treat, as always, but before we get started, I wanted to remind you guys to like, subscribe, follow our channel, leave some comments, let us know what you want to hear next, what you like about this episode. Um, we love the follow-up and we love the interaction. We take the time to read all the comments. So thank you guys for all your comments, everything that you do every week. We appreciate it. And now let's get started to the show. And what better way to introduce this cowboy and team Justin and Dorsey than to just tell you a little bit about all of the things that he's gotten to do. And this is when I say little bit, I mean a minor. We're so thankful that Brad has taken the time to be with us. But before I officially introduce him, let me just tell you a little bit about him. So he's actually the NRCHA Hackamore Classic Champion. He's a two-time World's Greatest Horseman qualifier. He is now um, a Run for the Million qualifier. Um, he has holds memberships in the American Quarter Horse Association, the National Range Cow, Cow Horse Association, the World Series of Team Roping, and the National Team Roping Association. Um, his specialty, though, I would say, is working cow horse, cutting, roping. Um, he is the owner of Berkemeyer Performance Horses and um, a dad to Bryce and Zane and a husband to Mindy. And we've got to give them a little shout out too, because um, both his wife and his son have qualified or have won world championships through the AQHA world. So just an incredible guy, incredible family, currently resides in Scottsdale, Arizona, while he is originally a Montana cowboy. And we're so excited to get to his to get to hear his story. So ladies and gentlemen, none other than Brad Barkemeyer. Brad, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. That was a great introduction. I appreciate being here. Well, you know, when you're that awesome, it kind of makes me want to run out of breath <laughs> talking about how awesome you are. So yeah, we, we so appreciate your time and um, we can't wait to get to hear the rest of your story. And I think I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in with you because your, your story is a little bit unique. You've gotten to kind of um, grow up on the back of a horse. And I want to hear your perspective through all of that. So I have a super serious question before we get started. And <laughs> I hear that the word on the street is you won your first belt buckle at eight years old. And I can only imagine what that's like. Tell us about it. Yeah. So uh, there used to be before the World Series and the handicap numbered system, there used to be a team roping association through the International Feedlot Cowboys, of which my parents were involved. And so we had several ropings around our neighborhood that were involved with that organization. And they always had fun stuff going on during the roping. So like sheep riding and miscellaneous, uh, you know, kid, youth events. So I'm proud to say my first buckle, uh, I won the mutton busting at the feedlot roping when I was eight. And uh, my brother that's a year older was the rodeo clown. So he was he was fighting sheep while I was riding them. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty fun experience. Um, I still have the buckle today. It's a, it's a Shetland pony with a monkey riding it and it's coming out of shoot number nine. It's just a, it's a really fun, uh, memory. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I would say that that's one of the better belt buckles. That might be the most prestigious one you've ever won. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everyone here, if, if you've been listening for a while, or if you know, Justin at all, uh, we're very familiar with mutton busting. We love it. We support it. And so I had to throw that little fun fact in there before we actually got started with the real interview. But um, kind of like what what we do with every podcast is we give the opportunity to have the guests tell a little bit about their background, their self, who they represent. So tell us a little bit about you. How did you get started in riding in the horse industry, riding horses? So the initially it was just out of necessity, basically to go with my parents and work every day, you know, before before we got into school. And so we had a feedlot and a cow calf operation there in Montana. And uh, as far as I can remember back, I wanted to be involved in that. And so my parents allowed me the opportunity to have some nice horses that were safe that I could ride and, and, uh, feel like I was helping. I'm sure I was in the way, but, uh, all the while, obviously good lessons in learning how to work and read livestock and be a horseman and, um, learned a lot from my father as far as horsemanship goes. And, uh, so I, I got started that way. Took that on to colt starting. You know, I did some clinics with Buck Branneman. My dad was a student of Ray Hunt. So that um, that logic and that theory of horse training was strong in our family. So we were trying to be 
better horsemen, not just handling livestock. Uh, so that was instilled in me at a young age, and I found a real calling and a, a natural path to to being a colt starter. Did some some colt starting on my own, and uh, started actually riding horses for the public when I was thirteen, probably. Um, so I'd take outside horses in from the neighbors that they had problem horses or colts that needed to be started, and it worked out great because I could do that after school or on weekends and help around the neighbor's ranches and stuff like that. So that part got me into being a trainer, right? I was observing and watching the guys around me and trying to learn every little bit that I could. Um, we always had a little team roping going on. My mom and dad both team roped at the time. Um, so I was working on the groundwork and being a better horseman for that event as well. Um, which led into some junior rodeo and high school rodeo events where I roped calves and team roped with my brother. Um, didn't get into horse showing at all until I was in college. So I had really no idea um, where that could take me at that time. So I went to college, mm, not with the intent of being a professional horse trainer. I went to college to get an education and work in the agricultural sector somewhere in the livestock business. Um, but God has that way of forming your path. And if you listen and follow along, end up where you belong. So, and that's what, that's what ultimately um, led to my career as a horse trainer, working for David Avery, Gary Lynn Olson there in, in Bozeman at Montana State University and started out cleaning stalls and just watching and seeing how it all worked. And it was interesting because I wanted to be on the rodeo team there at Bozeman but being involved in that horse show program, I understood and learned that uh, you could get paid to train horses and still compete and that the, the owners were um, going to support you and help you get down the road and pay for expenses to get their horses shown. Uh, seemed like a little safer, more secure path as far as making a living rather than busting your tail trying to win money at rodeos every weekend. So that's what sent me on to that path. Um, I'm trying to be brief on the story, but from there, uh, outside of college, I, I uh, moved to New Mexico, continued to work for David Avery there. And he was at that time training a lot of team roping and calf roping horses for the AQHA shows primarily. Uh, so that was my first glimpse into the American Quarter Horse Association. Mm -hmm. The first, I'll never forget the first world show that I went to. You got the best of the best horses and trainers and every discipline all on one breed of horse, right? And so it kind of gives you that appreciation of this is a pretty amazing animal. And just solidified a little bit like, hey, I'm, I'm where I belong. That's the right tool to get me to my goals. And the quarter horse is uh, obviously an amazing animal. So I was able to see the different events. And at that time, we weren't quite uh, specialized in each event as we are now. Um, it was still kind of the end of the era as far as people being real diverse trainers. And, and a lot of trainers were training multiple disciplines. So I got to see guys, you know, um, that were showing pleasure horses and then come back and show in the reining and then maybe have a rope horse or two. So that really fit my character you know i'm always been a um a fan of diversity where you don't just are you're not just good at one thing i want to be good at multiple events and i just feel like we're better horsemen when we're riding the horse with the intent of trying to find out what's the horse's best event and what we can do to help groom that and to get those natural talents to come out rather than forcing them into a box of this is the event that I train. So this is the event that you're going to do and they either make it or don't. So long story short, Four Horse World Show was a, a great experience. It it really opened my eyes to the possibilities of training quarter horses and, and having a career that way. Yeah. Wow. So, so well said. Um, yeah. And I, I actually have so many questions there. So bear with me. I, I know that it's going to be kind of hard. We're going to go back and forth a little bit. I wanted to touch just a little bit more on 
Um, we're going to kind of go back then to your um, childhood upbringing. And um, I read somewhere that you had your first horse was a black mare. And I'm sure you remember her fondly. So tell us the memories that you had growing up with her and, and what it was yeah. like there. So my actual first horse was a was a gelding named Shorty. And he was probably 16 hands. He was huge. And the funniest thing about him is we had to have help to catch him because he was kind of mean. Like you go out there in the pen with him at the halter and he'd pin his ears and try to chase you out of the pen. But once you got a hold of him, he was a big dog. So anyway, my uh, that was my real first horse. But the, the main youth horse that I had was a black mare that my grandmother had raised. My mom's mom was uh, into quarter horse racing. And uh, they bred and raced uh, some some good quarter horses in the all oh, seventies and, and early eighties. Uh, my dad had a pretty strict no mare policy around the feedlot around the ranch, uh, so I don't exactly know. And I I should ask him sometime, but for some reason that mare got to stay, and thankfully she did. So I uh, I can't talk a lot about her because I know I'll get emotional about it, but. She uh, she was a really good mare that that, uh, you know, I just think it's uh, kids in when we're so impressionable at that age to have that kind of bond and relationship with an animal is life changing. Right. So you get to those life lessons and you learn about communication and you learn about safety and what boundaries you can push between animal and human and. To have a horse that respected that and taught me a lot um yeah that's it's uh really fond memories of that mare wow and it's really cool for me to hear you talk so highly of her and to even mention emotions about a horse that makes me um that leads sets me up for this next question that i'm really curious about it um i'm going to kind of throw you off a little bit so sorry about that but um oh, i i know that the team roping journal they had a whole article and deemed you as the horseman's horseman and, um, that right there proves it. I think that you, you treat the horses with such respect and it sounds like you did from the very beginning. So, um, kind of tell us about what it's like being the horseman that you are. And then, um, the bond, talk about the bond really quick with, um, the horses that you get to train and, and is it ever hard giving them back once you've trained them and, and you've given mm -hmm. them back to the owners? Tell us, tell us about all of it. Okay. So as far as being the horseman's horseman, I thought that was a huge compliment you know uh very appreciative of of them theme roping journal and and trying to get that word out of you know just the respect of our peers and and being known that way so that's you know more important to me than any buckle or trophy that I could win so um appreciative of that the bond with the horses uh you know I think that over time, it's gotten easier, you know, because I've gone through so many horses so that that transition gets easier each time. But there's always those ones that get a hold of your heart a little bit that it's a little more special relationship than just the working relationship that we have with our horses that are in training. Um, it's I think it's a real important balance, especially for a professional to maintain that little bit of separation right there you don't want to get too close knowing that that end is near or is inevitable so that i think makes you be a little bit better trainer so that you're not maybe overlooking some flaws of that horse you know we got to be super critical to get the best out of them and so they're just it's a real balancing act and I, I can't wait to talk a little bit more and get a little bit needy, needy, gritty, nitty gritty on um, your training styles and all of that. But really quick, um, one thing that stood out to me was the um, that you, whenever you won the NRCHA Limited Derby or even, I mean, the Hackamore Classic. Um, talk to us about what it was like winning any prestigious title and what you learned from that and how you were able to walk away a champion, but also staying as humble as you are. So I think that limited derby championship was my first major uh, aged event title. And looking back on it, it seems insignificant now. But at the time, that's a that's a big deal for a young trainer. I'd just gone out on my own. Mindy and I had, I don't know, maybe 10 horses in training, you know. And I'll never forget, we, we had an old steel gooseneck trailer that we bought from her grandma, you know, making payments on that to try to get to the horse show. And you see all the pros show up with their big aluminum fancy gooseneck trailers and dually trucks and 
it's just part of that process of going through the stepping stones and overcoming the the hard stuff and working and um staying true to yourself along the way and um that first championship i'd say kind of solidified a little bit that i was where i belonged you know it gave me a little bit of uh, affirmation that yeah we're doing this right and this is this is awesome to win right now but we've got bigger goals coming down the road but um definitely a, a good kickoff you know and then the hackmore classic championship that was the first one that was like a big time title i beat the open guys in that and i was i finally felt like i was one of them so that was kind of the turning point as far as me solidifying that involvement and being respected enough to be able to get those judges to take a look and actually feel confident and given the big score to be a champion and that was a um, turning point in my career for sure that kind of gives me chill bumps even just hearing you talk about it now because your perspective is so incredible. You could have definitely taken that title and gone on and thought, I'm better than you guys or whatever. But the way you've re remained so <laughs> humble is so um, – it's just eye-opening to me. It's 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 a very good trait, and I know that a lot of people in the industry have it. And um, so that's really cool. And, and I'm sure that comes with the hours and hours and hours that you've spent in the saddle on the days that are the hardest through all of that. So kind of let's, let's just start talking about the training process. And I know that you get to go all around the world teaching so many people, training them with their stubborn horses. Um, what's it like getting to do that and being the one that they look to for advice is that's got to feel pretty cool, right? It really does. And it's still, I catch myself time to time going, am I really qualified to be doing this? Right. I, I, I feel like I'm still learning. I'm still a student of the game. So uh, I have to catch myself every now and then, but it's been amazing. Um, some of the opportunities that we've had, uh, like the American Quarter Horse Association's affiliate program through the international affiliates. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go, go to Costa Rica twice. And uh, part of that is because of my diversity and, and I have, I, have experience in multiple events. So it's it's easy for me to be able to teach cutting and reining and do some roping and colt starting. And uh, so it, it's kind of, um, you know, more bang for their buck as far as having not having to have multiple conditions at, at those international shows. So that was uh, an amazing experience. And I'm really grateful that I was be able to part of that. The amazing thing to me is that really the horse unites us, you know, whether there's a language barrier or cultural differences or um, economic diversity, the horse is that common denominator and we're all equal when we're horseback. And, and it's pretty cool to see people come in and have light bulb moments when they've been training or working with a horse and frustrated and not making progress. And you tweak one little thing and they go, Oh, it makes sense. And then the horse is happy and now we're making progress. So it's really fun to be able to influence horses and people in that regard. Oh yeah. That's, I mean, gotta be such a good feeling at the end of the day thinking, wow, yeah. we had breakthrough with a stubborn horse that this person yeah. has been, you know, trying for years and years and years. And kind of speaking on breakthrough a little bit, you have horses coming in and out of the barn every day. I'm sure it feels like, what's it like for you to, to be able to get a horse that's, you know, fresh green. And even if it's not fresh or green, at least it's fresh or green to it's, it's, um, the, you know, roping or, or, um, the working cow horse or the rain, you know, whatever discipline it is, it's, it's fresh to that discipline specifically. Um, mm -hmm. what's it like for you then to be able to see something from start to finish and then see it start performing well and competing and performing the way that you want it? What's, what's that like? Well, that's been a, that's been an involving process as well, you know? So, um, early in my career, I'd ride anything, you know, I'd, people would bring me whatever horses and I just needed to fill the stalls and make money and try to make a living. And I had a lot of horses that people sent that said, okay, we want to be a cow horse. And they were not, that horse was not suited for that event. And I, for the longest time, I would try maybe an internal optimist. I would think, oh yeah, we're showing, it's showing a little promise. I think we can get, you know, get there. And over the years and with experience and trial and error and some failures and victories, you learn that 
some battles aren't worth fighting, right? Some of those you just got to cut the cut the loss as soon as you know it's not going to make it. And so I've been better about that now that I've got a little more experience. So I'm not trying to be so optimistic on horses that aren't really suited for a specific event. So that's one part of the part process that has evolved. Um, the other piece of it is just giving the horse the opportunity to show their strengths and weaknesses and trying to ride that horse every day with a, um, I, I try to put a really solid foundation on them. Uh, and that foundation doesn't change for the discipline that they're doing. So they all get basically the same start. I, all, I expect the same um, am amount of movement in the body parts, softness in the face, willingness to move their feet and collection. Um, before we ever do a specific maneuver or event and then we'll experiment with the other events and find out where the horse shines and where it has trouble sometimes it's a mental issue sometimes the horse's mind isn't suited for that specific event or maybe they're just not athletically talented enough to do it but so those are the variable factors that we use along the way to use that process of elimination and determine whether they can stay and be a competitive show horse or whether they need to be a trail horse that you know is safe for somebody but that's that's all part of the process it really is and and that brings up a good point too in my own experience i was in high school and i had a really awesome reigning horse and um the working cow horse event reigned cow horse event was became available to compete at a high school and of course i jumped right in and learned mm -hmm. very quickly that just because it's a rainer or just because it's a roping roping horse does not mean that it's a working cow horse mm -hmm. and um that the, you're right they have to have at least for the cow events they have to have a little bit of a cow in them they have to be cowy they have to um kind of have the want and it's so funny i was just talking with one of my friends the other day um that her horse is currently out of trainers now and she was like yeah I, he, he thinks that we're going to try breakaway roping right now, but I don't think she has the mental capacity to stand in a box. And, right. um, that's so true. You have to be patient through all that. So I commend you there. I mean, you have a lot going on all the time and to have the patience yeah. to work through a problem with a horse and feel really good and, you know, let them cool off and then start it back over again every single day. That's so amazing to me, but um, along those same lines, you kind of already talked through what you were looking for when you're training in the process, but what, what do you look for in a horse? What's important for you? Uh, where do you draw the line? Where do you think mm, they're not going to cut it? They should try barrel racing. What's, what's right. your, what's your cut? Yeah. So I kind of, um, I've kind of changed my theory a little bit over the years <clears throat> used to be confirmation. Number one, all the time they have to have good feet and legs and be properly balanced. So, but what I found is We've got some so many exceptions to that rule that horses can be good performers without ha having to look and fit in that box perfect confirmation. So as a trainer, as somebody that's competing and performing, number one for me is their mind, right? They got to be a willing, e trainable, good-minded partner that wants to put out effort in that job. Number two would be their athletic ability, their raw natural talent. Do they have the gift the ability to do that job sliding stops fast spins have some cow instinct those kind of things and then on the confirmation third for longevity is this horse going to hold up over a number of years so that we can go through the training process and have a good finished product when we're done now if i was a breeder i'd probably reverse the whole thing and go confirmation first mind ability you know later but uh, I do think there's so many exceptions to that that rule of fu function over form um, when we're performing that it's it's a good way to look at it. And I think too, some people would say that that's really good advice for people and workers as well. You want someone with a good mind that's willing to work too. So I love right. your outlook there. And I'm genuinely curious if if you had to stop training tomorrow, uh, what would be the one thing that the training technique that you that you want to be known for? What's the Brad Barkemeyer? <laughs> wow. Um, I stumped him. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I, you know, I think um, it goes back to the the basics of you know the Ray Hunt Buck Brownman theory of make the right thing easy and the wrong thing difficult. And another one that always sticks in my mind is if you take the time it takes, it takes less time. And so patience crossed with some 
being assertive when things are going wrong to let that horse know that it's not going to have an easy way out, but the way that we want them to do it is going to be easy and they'll be rewarded for that. I guess that's, that's the basic technique that, that pretty much across the board for any discipline would work. Yeah, that's great. And I love that you gave the credit too. That that's incredible. And one thing, none of the stuff that we're doing is, is being reinvented, right? We're tweaking it all the time and we're innovating, but we're not inventing anything, right? So those that came before us, we're just trying to carry on that artwork that they've already put in front of us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Your, your brand, your personal ideas align so well with Justin. We do that a lot here. We want to preserve everything that was good and original. So, um, I love that. I love that so much. And I think young girl working with companies like Justin, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason we wear these patches. It's not because we're getting free stuff. It's because we believe in that product and that core, the values that you guys have fits us as, as well. And so I want to promote that and and try to get other people on board. Oh yeah. And our team does a really great job um, vetting every person and following them for a while and seeing their story and who they are inside and out of the arena. And that's why when we do slap a patch on a shirt for Justin, it means a lot more, you know, it, it means that those guys are guys and gals are out there paving the way and, and keeping everything good. And I think younger me would be so disappointed in myself if I didn't ask you this question. Um, I grew up with some trainers and um, I was in Oklahoma and and doing a lot of reigning. I did rodeo queen pageants. So reigning and rodeo queen go hand in hand. Um, But what's the camaraderie like as a professional horseman? Because like, I remember when I would go to the youth world and stuff like that, like, yeah, it was fun, but I wasn't there as a professional. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're going to work, you're going to your job. So um, tell us about the camaraderie there between the trainers and how you guys are able to channel the fun and channel the serious, just tell us about that. Okay. The, I think the rain cow horse association stands out a little bit on that regard, just because, um, there's a, there's the, our event is so difficult with three events to train for with the herd work, the rain work, the fence work. And there's so many variables in the show pen that we don't really have that domination of one or two trainers that are winning all the time. It's a, little more even playing field as far as you know any of these uh, horse show classes are judged right so there's always that element of political pull and and uh, having some momentum you know in your career and in that's that's the way it is and that's okay but that also can create some contention between you know exhibitors between trainers so I feel like in the cow horse our culture is such that we all are rooting for each other because we know how difficult that is to win. And there's a lot of camaraderie. We got to help each other train. We got to help each other in the practice pen and the herd work. And um, there's a lot of inner action going on between trainers. Nobody's trying to really hide their program from the next guy. It's uh, it's a really uh, friendly atmosphere. You know, obviously there's some differences between styles and character personalities, which that's life, right? Um, but I want to try to be that that guy that is always there to help my friend if he needs it. Um, and I have some friends that I know I can count on all the time. People's employees, their spouses, are they're all family basically it's one big family and we're cheering for each other when things are going well and we're there to help each other get picked up when things aren't that's beautiful i mean it's true if you walk down an aisle of a uh, any show barn at any show you see a lot of that happening and so mm-hmm. i love i love that you got to speak a little bit about that too and it, it kind of moves me into the next portion um, I want to learn more about like where your thoughts are, where you think the future of the industry is going, because if you think about when you first got started to now, it's changed so much. And and obviously there's more camaraderie, there's more family aspect, all of it. So um, talk about the future. Where do you, I mean, I know that's a very big loaded question, but where does your mind go when, when you think about the future of horse training, the future of the, the industry? Yeah, I think the visibility is the number one factor that's uh, the major difference now than it was in the past, even when I started my career. We're getting more sponsorships. We're getting more um, information out there, right? Obviously, technology has helped that along the way. 
We've got so many videos, subscription platforms that we can put out on training videos so that there's more and a more educated public. The other side of it is the um, the shows are becoming a little more spectator friendly. You know, it used to be all about the guys that were there to compete and you go there and it's, just, it's uh, we're basically um, just showing to each other. Well, now there's an audience, right? Whether it's on the live webcast or uh, actual people coming and sitting in the stands watching the events, that has grown uh, immensely. And so it's a snowball effect. Everything from the bottom up has grown. And I, I think that's gonna continue. Um, obviously our animal welfare uh, is gotta be at the forefront so that the uneducated public that shows up has a good experience and understands that we're taking care of our livestock. It's not just there for our, our entertainment. It's about preserving that Western lifestyle, preserving the, the traditions that is the reason we're showing horses to begin with. And then obviously the prizes and the money and the popularity are a side effect of that. Yeah, very, very well said. The insight there is is on point, I I personally think too. And so I'm curious to know and pick your brain a little bit more about um, the overall breeding programs for the future. I know we talked about how you, you listed if you were a breeder confirmation would have been first. Um, mm -hmm. What do you what do you think in the future? I know you, you're not you haven't dabbled too, too much in it. But what do you what do you think the um, the breeders out there are considering now in the future, too? With the uh increase in, in popularity of the in vitro and a lot of embryo transfer. And we're, we're getting a lot of numbers. Um, the big time mares are producing more babies every year. We're shrinking that gene pool uh, quickly, a lot more quickly than pre um, 2000. So I think Ultimately, we're going to have to start getting a little more of an outcross. I think our our bloodlines um, per event, and this is not just with the Western performance. I think it's with every event across the board. We're so specific on breeding those traits that we've got uh, a fairly close gene pool that's that we need a little more outcross. So maybe bringing a thoroughbred or a, a little more of a foundation type quarter horse to get some bone and get some skeletal mass back on our horses that we've lost a little bit over the years because we've isolated that to they have to be so athletic and so quick and so smart. Um, that part of that's uh, I feel like there's going to be a reverse a little bit to come back to some of that. That's a good point that that very well could happen. And, and that's that's good to be talked about, too. Um, I know that you kind of got your start in the beginning through your parents, through through everything, um, and you've, you've got to work with a lot of incredible trainers along the way. But I want to know from you, what are what are you doing or what do you wish to do to ensure the future generations are still staying encouraged and engaged in the industry and they're seeing the results of their hard work? Um, what do you what do you what are your thoughts there? I'll tell you, it's a little scary because. Uh you know, the society and culture that we live in today, it's harder to promote that Western lifestyle. It's harder to, we I feel like we've lost a little foothold there. Um, but it's encouraging at the same time, because just in my experience with my two boys there in high school, um, anytime that we get some of their friends to come out to the barn that have nothing to do with horses, I've never seen or been around a farm or ranch, um, they're immediately attracted to what we have going on. And it's, it's like they immediately have an appreciation for being outside of the city and being in the dirt and having cows and flies and, and manure around and just opening their eyes to that kind of stuff and seeing their re response gives me hope that there is that the desire for those young kids to, once they get a taste of it, once they get uh, exposed to it, that, it's an easy path to go on from there. So with that in mind, uh, obviously I'm teaching my kids that it's, it's the lifestyle. It's, it's about being a good human. It's about working hard, having responsibility. Um, and that's treating each other with respect and treating your animals with respect. And so our culture needs more of that. People need to understand that it's okay to work hard and it's okay to be nice. And so 
uh, all the kids that I come into contact with through my children, um, we try to, you know, lead by example and hopefully that they pick up on some of those things. Um, there's a lot of scholarship opportunities out there through our horse organizations besides 4-H and FFA and those kind of things. So really a proponent of promoting that. Um, there's a lot of work to do, you know, as far as getting more outreach to our youth. But uh, I feel like there's some great sponsors out there. Mars Equestrian did a, a really cool thing and, and invited the youth Cal Horse World's Greatest finalists to the Run for the Million this year. And so that was a great place to highlight, you know, our youth riders and a huge audience all over the world. So people can see that those opportunities are available. And I feel like if we can get the parents interested, they'll see our kids being good humans. And they're, they're thinking, I want my child to, to be like that. And if we can uh, influence one or two kids, it's worth doing. So hopefully we'll be able to do that along the way. Wow. It sounds like this was a TED talk. That's I, I shouldn't have even been here. You did so good. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I'm leaving encouraged and empowered thinking about the future and um, just that just what you're doing alone with your sons, but also like with their friends and multiplying that. So, wow. So incredible. And we're out of time for now, but I know that a bunch of people want to keep up with you if they don't already. So where can we find you? Tell us everything, social media, website. Um, we want to be able to keep up with you and support you the best we can, everyone out there listening. Um, so where can we find you? So we're at Barkemeyer Horses on Instagram and Facebook. Um, uh, we have a video subscription format through Horse and Rider magazine. So horseandrideronDemand.com. That's a great place to um, keep up with my training techniques. It's not just me. It's it's myself and uh, some of the greatest trainers in the industry across the disciplines from barrel racing to um, ranch riding, cow horse cutting. So that's a really cool platform that I wanted to put a little plug in um, for any of the listeners that may want to find out more about performance sources. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for being here today. I know you are swamped. You got a lot going on. Um, I'm just so thankful that you took the time to talk with us on the Kick Your Boots Up podcast. And I know everyone at Justin is so proud of you. We continue to love what you're doing. And so keep it up. We're cheering you on and we cannot wait to see what is next for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate Justin and all that you guys do as well. Um, it's, it's, I've been and wearing Justin boots since the eighties. Right. So it's like, um, just really neat to be involved with a company that's got that stronghold through the industry. And we're going to keep this thing going. Well said, I couldn't agree more. That's exactly why I love working here too. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on kick your boots up. I'm your host, Taylor McAdams, and we can't wait to share the next story of the West. Until then, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Follow us on social media at Justin Boots to keep up with our next episode. And we'll see you the next time you kick your boots up.